And it's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion. Professors as experts, co-learners, or both. Um, I work with Eric, and as the school was especially starting, I guess in August, we were training our graduate students, and it seemed that their biggest fear was not being an expert in whatever they were being asked to help uh, facilitate with some instructors about their, their teaching styles. And we really, we thought that it might strike a chord with other people because the sphere is really deep-seated and we never really talked about sort of a constructive co-learning environment. And obviously a district record, thank you all for, for coming here. Um, and I guess in reality, we know we can't know everything. And I guess the first step is letting go of that notion and seeing the freedom that happens when, when you actually do let that go. And I think that you can really get creative and student-centered when you make a curriculum that is co-learning focused. And you can foster a learning environment based on kind of mutual respect and even fulfill some social justice themes in your coursework. Um, and I think that it takes a lot more work <laughs> than predefined kind of textbook syllabi and going by whatever people have done before, but it's really worth it. And so to discuss this topic with us today, we have Eric, Andrea, and Paul. And I'm going to ask them to uh, tell us a little bit about themselves and about their uh, teaching experience. Can you start with me? Hi, I'm Eric. And in terms of my teaching experience, I did a little bit in graduate school, more in a postdoc, and then a lot more in my uh, five years teaching at Penn State Altoona. We had three three loads and frequent new preps and heavy research and service obligations on top of that. And it includes courses from introductory up to advanced, several of which we had to design ourselves, and several of which lent themselves more or less to being non-expert. So. Hi, my name is Andrea Chemplik, and I teach here in the Department of Philosophy. My area of specialty is ancient Greek philosophy, so I'm very traditional. And then when I don't do that, I do Kant. Oi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I taught previously at a, a small liberal arts college that had an amazing core curriculum um, where they had uh, uh, faculty teams, lead plenary sessions, and then everybody would break into groups. But they would do it that the person who was not the expert had to teach the plenary session. So for example, I had to teach Newton and, and Darwin, and somebody else would teach Descartes. Uh, the chemistry teacher would do Shakespeare. Um, and that was an amazing experience. And we can talk about that more. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm Paul Wapner. I teach in the School of International Service. And my area of specialty is global environmental politics. Uh, this is my first and only academic job, so I can't say that I've um, that I, I have any other experience except AU. Um, but I've taught <laughs> undergraduate, graduate classes, lots of reading courses, and um, and yeah, and I have lots of thoughts about teaching what we don't know. Wonderful. I was wondering if each of you could also discuss some more about your experience as being a non-expert at the front of the classroom and how you might think that will benefit your students' education. Um, well, for me, it's largely an issue of being honest with the students. So if you're honest about the things that you know, you also have to be honest about the things that you don't know. And in lower level classes, you often know most of the materials, although often there are questions that they'll ask, and if you don't know the answer, you just say so. In my more advanced classes, I often intentionally designed in non-expert situations. So one of the examples that I brought some props for, if anybody cares, is for my advanced um, philosophy of psychology class. And we would read, the first book was a classic historic book about a person who I'm an expert in. A second book uh, was a collection of chapters, one of which I authored about similar issues. And then the third book would be a recently published book in the same area that basically would jump us forward almost 100 years in terms of scientific advancement and the way people are wrestling with this material. And I made it a point that the third book was always a book that I hadn't read yet. Um, but it was a book in the area. And part of why I did this was because I think that the transition from high school to college is largely about struggling with things that are not certain and learning that a lot of the ways you were taught in high school and the things you were taught in high school were just the high school version of whatever it is that's really going on. And so 
I wanted to sort of model exploring and finding out new information and working through new materials. So when the students asked, man, where is he going with this in the next chapter? I could look at them with full honesty and say, I don't know. Now, I can make a more educated guess maybe than you can because I sort of know where I think this is going, but I'm definitely not certain, and we're definitely here trying to figure it out together. We're, we're co-figuring it out. Um, and for the students who that clicked for, it, it really seemed to be a very valuable experience for them. When I was in graduate school, I studied Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and I learned all about the different... I learned all about the difference between um, the bank deposit model of education, where the sage on the stage performs and deposits the wisdom in the students' heads, and the problem-solving approach to education. And I was very taken with that. And as I just told you, I'm, uh, my discipline is philosophy. And so when I teach um, the ancient texts, I tell my students, for 2,500 years, people have tried to figure out what this text means. They have not come to an agreement yet. The only ones who think they know are dogmatists, and they have stopped asking questions. So I tell them that they have as good a chance as I do in making sense of the text. So let's read the text together, and that's how I conduct my entire class. Um, I just taught last semester a class on Plato, and um, the students were so excited. And I said, if I'm really successful, at the end of the class, you will know less about Plato than at the beginning. <laughs> And according to them, I succeeded. They weren't quite sure how to fill out the evaluations, where it says, how much did you learn in this class? Because what we learned is that these, these texts are deep, and you can keep on asking questions, and you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, uh, the other thing that really frustrates students is that they have no idea what I think. I'm also the expert in the class because I can read the text in Greek. So if there is a textual problem, I, they can consult with me, and I look up the original, and I say, that's a bad translation. Maybe if we translate it that way, it makes more sense. But I, I really try to instill with them the great classic texts that they must, they must learn for themselves. If you want to major in philosophy, you must do philosophy. You must critically read texts and come to your own conclusions on the basis of your reading. So I, um, I, the papers I assign in my class, I call I search papers, not research papers. Um, because how, how will you do research on, on Plato? There are millions of books out there. Which book are you going to choose? On the basis of what? You first have to establish your own reading. And so that's sort of um, how I conduct the class. And I do feel like I'm learning alongside them. They come up with interpretations that I've never heard before. So it's very exciting. So can people hear? Does this even work? Uh, it's for the camera. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess it. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, a number of years ago, I came to one of these conferences, and uh, Jamie Raskin spoke. I don't know if you know Jamie in the law school. And he had this phrase that really kind of stuck with me. He said, um, I teach best um, what I most want to know. And um, I thought that was a great phrase. I teach best what I most want to know. And it seemed to me that captured sort of how I feel in the classroom, that I'm sort of most alive when I'm wrestling with something that, or we're dealing with a topic that I really don't know the answer to. And so um, what, I, what I've been trying to do is to um, go, into, <clears throat> excuse me, go into each class thinking about what's the question that I think is interesting and that I'm struggling with, and let that frame the material um, so that uh, one is, so it's interesting to me, um, and that's, pro that's, I suppose, selfish. But um, the assumption behind that is if it's interesting to me and I can s that I take my job as trying to, um, uh, I don't know if the word's persuade, but try to develop a sense within the classroom of what's important about this question and why is it relevant um, for our lives. Um, and what that seems to do is, one is it's sort of a, uh, it's honest. Um, and it's also that then, instead of like asking a question and then kind of, you know, entertaining different responses, waiting to get to what I really want to hear, um, I could actually ask a question and, and listen to what's being said and, and let that 
drive the inquiry. And um, it's really nice because then things happen that are really surprising, but then there are insights that can happen in class that go way beyond what I sort of imagined. Um, yeah, now I was thinking about this panel that I was thinking, well, some of us teach courses where there's just material, I don't know, if you're teaching chemistry, I guess, that there's just material that you cannot avoid. And, um, and there's that, I should say, in global environmental politics, too. I mean, students need to know, I don't know, international agreements on climate change. But it strikes me that, for me anyway, the best way to even approach that material is to frame it within a larger question of, well, why even bother learning that stuff? Why is it relevant for my life? Why is it relevant for my students' lives? And to, um, to uh, yeah, couch and contextualize material constantly in terms of what's what's really at stake here and why would we want to know it? And the final thing I would just add is that um, uh, many of you have probably read Rilke's letters to a young artist, uh, young poet, artist, poet, um, the German specialist here. Uh, but he talks about, <clears throat> excuse me, living the questions. That is to say, questions aren't necessarily puzzles in search of solutions, but they are, um, they are inquiries. They are sort of launching pads. And I think that all of us kind of live a certain question for a while, and then we find our, or set of questions, and then we find ourselves living another set of questions. And it seems to me to experiment with that in class seems, um, seems worthwhile. I really appreciate that sentiment. Um, coming from an arts background, another, I guess, messy topic where you're talking a lot about uh, some really, some people being, you know, showcased as what one should learn, but that might not necessarily be what is important to the student or the learner. When we talk about a prayer idea of um, kind of making that knowledge available and making sure that the knowledge we teach is applicable to authentic situations is something that's really exciting, especially when you start with a, like a theme where each student can decide which particular aspect of that theme they want to explore or how something in their background relates to that theme um, and goes into other cultures or other spaces. Um, I just wanted to maybe ask a first question for Paul. Um, so part of the pitch when we were thinking about and organizing this session was the idea that especially new teachers feel this overwhelming pressure to be an expert in all things at every second of class. Um, and so, for example, if I was asked to teach a course on the effects in South America of ocean temperatures rising. I might think to myself, well, boy, do I need to know the answer for this so I know exactly how to design the syllabus so that I know what the answer is at the end so that when the students ask me what the effect is, I have an answer and I know it. And what you suggested was that you really honestly not know the answer to the question when the class starts and that, that you're really seeking an how did you, did you always teach that way or was there some sort of awkward transition to teaching that way or how did you develop that style? Hmm. Um, well, I think probably all of us have that experience of going into class and thinking, at least I still do. I mean, I go into my freshman seminar and I assume they actually know more than I do, like that they're going to see through me and realize that actually, you know, uh, he's, he's just sort of skating through or something like that. Um, and it's interesting that after all these years, that hasn't gone away, that hmm. sense of a little bit of insecurity, like, oh. But, but, but I think part of that comes from that we know this material so well that we see the holes in it, and we just assume they see them too. Um, and then there's the memory, actually, they actually don't really see them, but they, they'll say something and they go, oh, my God. They, like, you know. Uh, so I don't know if I've ever gotten over the, I don't think I've built up a, a sense of confidence that somehow um, I can do anything with a sense of unknowing. But um, I would say that uh, it also came from, I remember teaching a class once, and I got this question, and it was shows you how old I am. It was during the first Gulf War, and someone asked a question about the fires. There were fires in Iraq at the time, and someone asked if those fires would uh, were going to affect the, uh, the global environment. And... Uh, and I had read a little bit, and I said, well, you know, there's been some theories about affecting the monsoons and so forth, 
I said, but the evidence about that is sort of out. I said, but it's like smoking 10 packs of cigarettes a day if you live there. And a hand went up and it said, is that true? And then I realized I just made that up. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is kind of irresponsible. Um, so I, so then I f tried to find a middle ground of sort of how to take something, take a question, but then ask what's behind the question. And um, so I, I would say I'm still learning, but I would say it's an aspiration of mine that I think to, to um, but I have a question for you. So oh. That's okay. <laughs> okay. When you say being honest, mm -hmm. um, uh, what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean in terms of, is it just sort of saying, look, class, I really don't know everything, or is there, I, I sense that there's um, something so, deeper in there. So we talked about this actually a little bit in the, the session about, that we just came from about um, talking about the value of general education classes and things like that. And part of what I would say is, is not only to be honest with them about what you're doing in class, but also why you think it should be good for them. So one of the things I hope we talk a little bit about is how we think that these sorts of different ways of teaching benefit the students. Um, so for example, explaining to the students that this is some, these, are, these are questions that I don't expect you to have a firm answer to because people have wrestled for them for 2,500 years and I don't expect a college sophomore to solve this problem this month. Um, that, that these are long-term questions. And for when I do sort of these more intentional, larger interventions with the students, I like to tell them things like, look, we're figuring it, this out together, and this is actually better for you than me pretending that I know it because I read the book once before that what college is about, especially at the upper levels, is about learning how to figure out and think through these ideas and learning how to struggle with them. And it is actually a virtue that we are doing this right now live in the classroom. Like right now, what's happening in this classroom is the real thing. And the thing you're more comfortable with is kind of fake. That's really interesting. Um, for the rest of the session, we'd really like to hear from you and what you're interested in. So I was wondering if we could take maybe five to seven minutes and Get with the people around you and share what you'd like to discuss today and maybe formulate some questions that you'd like to ask one another and the people on the panel. Does that sound good? Yeah? Great. Strengths we we don't have we, we we don't have any like uh, mathematicians on here on the panel. I've done this in staff's classes before. Yeah. Um, the one that I chose that was kind of screw up for this a little bit. Um, radical embodied cognitive science. So I know quality. American philosophy is like a genius like a hundred years ago. Scientists still have to go up. And so, so I assigned this book and we're going through it. And these are and there was a students who are uncomfortable with like intro staff, staff and in the middle of it there are differential equations. Wow. Um, what are you? Uh-huh. So, so I had to come up with tricks and ways to get them through. The beginning I mean, it would have been helpful, bad. although I could not design the syllabus because I was taking on someone else's syllabus at the last minute. I mean, part of it is, I think, we were saying my chemistry, you know, I suspect but that in some disciplines, this is more important than the higher levels than it's being So they can do it at a different level. I have somebody asking me whether they know they're a Muslim or a pixel or something. He's here as famous experiments right now. Well, actually, Milgram's diaries just got unlocked from the walls. Every time you take a break, I'm going to take a break. But you can't do it as much as you can in your class as you put it. But I think you can always frame something into the question, yeah. and then they become the inquirers, right? And rather than just packaging the information and dumping it, mm -hmm. uh, because they have to reach for it, otherwise they're not going to take it in. So I think even with me, you know, I mean, and with math especially, but, uh, I once read an article. Uh, the reason why math teacher and logic teachers are so um, are so strict, you have to do the problem this way, or even 
have to be here. It's because they actually have nothing to teach them. Uh, and like the person is teaching history, and there's all this history, and literature, because the math is all units. Right? They have to be down. <laughs> and so the only way they can absorb power is they have to be the Bible. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So and I think actually, so my son, I have a son who's in high school, I remember a couple years ago, going back to school, and I would get a math teacher. And I said, well, why are you doing this? And the, and the teacher had no answer. And the answer was, basically, it's on the computer. And horrendous. Horrendous. <coughs> and just to communicate to that to so then my son, just, my son wants to know why. If someone can tell why, he'd actually do it really well. Mm -hmm. But if you don't tell them why, and not tell them why, but if you don't sort of get things, you sort of need to kind of come to it. Mm -hmm. and I, think that's really mm -hmm. I suspect that's why I did well in math and math, but I think I, for me, I could just always kind of see how it was relevant. And then it was, I mean, I took a first year of calculus, and at the end of that first year, I was like, okay, I'm just kind of not seeing it anymore. Right now. But somehow, I mean, just sort of being able to see it took me up to that point, and then I was like, I don't know why I would feel fine. So, my question is, what is it? See. Because I think that's what we're all wrestling yeah. What is inquiry? What is it about inquiry that's so important? So, like, when I teach, like, uh, psychological statistics, what I really want to get is the relation between the statistics and the research methods and asking questions. That these are ways to answer questions in terms of and if I can't get them to see that, then they're not going to do well. So, I think, and then that's a, another point. And then there's a previous question. Is it, the question is, they care. And then how do we get, not get them to care, but they do care. How do we find where they're caring and articulate that in a way that allows this context to I used to teach logic, and um, it's a very frustrating thing because you can't teach it. They have to see it. So, you say, um, so the only thing you can do is do some proofs, and then they do proofs, and then you can see in the class all of a sudden somebody will have a quick smile on their face because mm -hmm. they saw it. They saw it. They saw the logical connections and how it works. It's amazing. But it's many students come up to me and say, Well, I don't know what you do. You just haven't learned it. Learn they're uh, formalizing how you actually think. And that's a beautiful thing. To try to set up a, a conundrum you know, that you look at and say, um, what would be the logical thing that would happen yourself. in this case? <laughs> have them discover I, a law, you're that proud of your the logic, logic. <laughs> My Western philosophy class that I was in was a genetic class. Um, always has a theme, and for the last couple of years, I've like, been like, self knowledge. So that's, that's just great. I mean, I don't have to do a lot of interesting ways. But even so, you know, even if you're developing a world theme, they're trying to identify those But in fact, part of that world theme is also incredible. I not trust the world theme. So, some level, the critique has to come. What we're not trying to do is get you to codify ideologically a position. We're trying to get them to get a sense of ideas, but then also have undermining ideas. This is, that's why we have been very unhappy if somebody had called me a platonist. I found that when I was a platonist, it's a dog's story. Really interesting. One of my students wrote a paper in the last semester of life, they go, it's not a platonist. Right. Exactly. It's an uneasy dance between the two sides. So, 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 and USC Law School have done a lot of work to push the envelope on documentary best practices. Well, it is legitimately scary. Huge stuff. Well, I. I <laughs> Um, I just wanted to start with a slight modification of the to, of the answer that I gave to Paul earlier, which is that um, uh, about the honesty. 
And so I don't want to convince anybody in the room to do the types of interventions that I do necessarily, but um, I think the honesty thing is very important. I mean, if you're doing something in class that you think is virtuous for the students, tell them what you're doing and tell them why you think it's virtuous. Um, and so the things that I think are virtuous might be very different from the things that you think are virtuous, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the students benefit from it, even if it's just because they understand better what's going on in class and what their role is in it. Um, and oftentimes, even just being that honest with them can get them to rethink what's going on in education in your class and other people's classes in an important way. Interesting. Uh, one of the themes that I heard a lot about was discussing the younger students and how you're able to even begin broaching a subject that has more than one answer or no answer at all. Um, maybe in the back, would you guys share some of your, your questions or comments? Well, one of the things that we were talking about, and I'm glad you mentioned that, because it, when you talked about general education classes, it occurred to me um, how does this go over with people who we might call, for one of a better way of uh, terming, black and white thinkers, or as someone who's a member of our group here suggested, students who have been um, shaped to work to the test. And so they're very outcome oriented and very narrow. Speaking so right. the, the question was how do we deal with this with students who are very black and white thinkers or students who have been trained to think for the test. And back there was our question about age or cognitive development. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so there were two views basically to respect the beginning with the younger ones and the graduate ones in terms of this. Uh, yeah, so the question was how do you set this expectation at the beginning with respect to the various techniques whether following a predetermined set of ideas or that is the so how can you how can you set expectations for students, especially students who are younger and or newer to college? Uh, was there any other questions or ideas being discussed in other groups uh, somewhere? Um, yeah. What, one of one of the things I'll just lay out that I raised at the end was that if one of the aspects of being co-learners is participation, like different forms of participation, like sharing resources, sharing articles, bringing material to the class, going to events, I don't know, this is something that I try to do my class. Then you have to figure out how to measure it. Like if it's a percentage of the grade, how to measure it. And that can become like very um, labor intensive to figure out like what is the rubric or what's, what's your system. I mean, I, I'm trying to not create like more work for myself, but mm -hmm. I think being a co-learner, co you want to figure out what, what indicates someone is co-teaching other people in class. So, so the, the question there was about how you transform this into something that doesn't kill you on the grading side and the logistical side, because you want to try these new methods, but you also don't want to make your life miserable in the process. Yes. yes. Was your question um, answered or discussed? Well, it sort of built on that. It was, it was just an extension of our, the question that I wanted to clarify, maybe. So um, part of the issue about setting expectations is about um, Right? So if mm. students feel disoriented by the fact that suddenly there's no sage up in the front of the classroom, is that going to come back and you know hurt you later? And so maybe some feedback on that. So how does this affect student evaluations and you know how how risky is it as a career move, basically? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So questions about how do you stay credible as as the professor doing these types of things? And I think there's one more, right? Yeah, and just to add on to what you were saying about how young professors always want to appear as a young graduate school and doing all this stuff, can actually discount that there are a lot of students in their class who have a lot of professional experience, like especially in doctoral programs, mm. who might have spent 10 years that you spent in grad school acquiring some kind of experience, but you discount it so that can really put off the students and make them feel like, I think that's a pretty good chunk to deal with right now. So the, uh, the last uh, person pointed out that especially when you're dealing with returning students or graduate students, often you have a classroom full of people who have more experience than you do in lots of potentially relevant ways. Um, and that can 
be a struggle to deal with because the traditional method of teaching sort of discounts whatever they've come into the classroom with. It's a really good point. Mm -hmm. So we're discussing some, some of the, I guess, issues. Oh, sorry, yes? Oh, so we talked about uh, putting the burden back on the uh, learner. And so it's submitting their own evaluation. And why should I give you those five points or whatever it is? And so that might make it more feasible. Back to the so back to the grading issue, it was pointed out that you could save some time potentially and, and headache by flipping the question around to them and doing sort of a self-awareness exercise. So saying, if you think this was graded wrong, why should I give you back those points? How can you convince me that you earned the grade you think you earned? So maybe starting at this end, Paul, do you have any response to the ideas of uh, teaching black and white thinkers or returning students? Um, I was actually going to respond to it one of the other okay. <laughs> Um I think this question about participation and how do you measure sort of co-learning, I think it's a great question. And um, for, for me personally, it's not so much that I want to, um, uh, it's not so much that, um, that it's sort of like questions, build on questions and that's what education is. I mean, I think there's some, there's, there's things to learn and I think that, but what the questions do is the questions are the inspiration to learning. And so for me, the way I know if students are sort of asking the questions is, ironically, how well they get the material. In other words, I know this sounds sort of counterintuitive or maybe even contradictory, but I think if we can get, ex when I know when a class is excited about a question and they kind of get it, and then they get it, and then the material falls in place. Now they put their own judgment on how to present that material, for my classes, students write essays or they write papers and um, or they make arguments in class. And it's less about sort of, for, I mean, th they put their own creativity in the frame of the response, but then it has to be backed up with information, material, insights about what we've learned. So to me, it's not the evaluation of them getting it. The, the evaluation of their co-learning um, actually comes by um, did the excitement turn on so that they could actually um, organize the material in however they want, but there's still material to organize. So I don't know, it's kind of cutting, the, uh, cutting that in two ways. The other thing I wanted to just say is that in terms of teaching evaluations and this notion of the sage up front, um, when my daughter, uh, my daughter's now in college, um, and uh, when she went through sort of primary school and so forth, it was really clear to me that the places where she learned the most, the classes she learned the most in was when she felt like that the, the teacher actually revealed themselves. She would come home and say, you know, so-and-so, you know, I don't know, has a daughter like me or so-and-so. And, -so. and it was like those little things actually meant a lot to her and it, it kind of invested her in the class. And I would think that even in college, I think that that's when we're honest and we kind of reveal ourselves, it's not telling them our life story, but when we're struggling along with them, then I think we can find each other, and I think that's part of this co-learning. It's not sort of, I'm just a kind of a neutered, politically objective, um, uh, I don't know what, uh, you get the picture. Um, so I think that's part of this, is sort of how can we bring ourselves to the classroom that in fact, um, so that there's an opening, so there's a connection. Um, I've been teaching in the UC, the University College. So um, last semester I had 24 freshmen in my class. And um, when we're talking about co-learning, it's not just a student and myself, but they learn from one another. And when that community starts happening, very exciting things start happening. Um, I was incredibly lucky, I guess. The class was amazing. And they were coming, by the time I came into the class, they were already talking about the material. Um, but I do have them write something for every class. I have an assignment I call a dialectical journal, um, where they have to identify a passage in the text that they found particularly disturbing or interesting and explain why. Why, do, why is this so important to you? So that means when they come to class, they will have done the readings. And they will be ready to discuss. And, and it's this exercise that also helps them to generate questions. And um, we discussed that briefly before, but uh, I try to persuade my classes that one of the most important skills is to ask questions. 
And it's, it's when you ask a good question, then new stuff starts happening, right? And it's through asking questions that we make connections. I've heard from many students what they, what they really like when they take classes that interrelate and they can make a connection from here to there to here to there. They find that incredibly exciting because they're building up their way of looking at the world, right? So, um, I, so I think young students are just as capable <laughs> as the older students to do this exercise. In fact, it's very important that we start them right from the get-go to ask questions. Um, I encourage them to go to other classes and ask difficult questions, as hard mm -hmm. as they can be, um, because it will help everybody. So, um, sage on the stage, guide on the side. Seems to be the model, right? Um, uh, as I said before, I, it is, I, I, I find it much easier, frankly, to just, just go in and lecture and just babble on. As you can see, I can babble, babble, babble. Time up, right? It's hard, but what I learned, I learned to listen, and I think that's the most important thing, is you have to listen to your students. And they have to learn how to listen to each other, and to, to me, as well. So listening and asking questions, I think, very important. Um, and I think we, we started with the question about how do you not make your life so much more difficult with this, right? Is that the one we're on? Um, I have done things like what you were talking about um, with, you know, assignments where you have to, usually what I prefer is a passage you found particularly interesting for some reason, but often it's something that you didn't understand but you think is important um, or things like that. Um, and often what I'll do is have the class write questions on the board before class starts to try to encourage them to be talking about it and thinking about it um, before class starts. And often in terms of participation, what I tell them is, look, we're trying to have discussions here and I know you guys might not have had this type of course before, so when we start out, I'm going to give you a lot of support to teach you how to do this. But if all goes well, you guys will just do it, and then your grade in terms of contributing to class or whatever participation percentage I'm required to list in the syllabus will, will just be an A. And if for some reason you don't do it, you'll know exactly what it is that you're not doing. Um, and I've never had a student complain about what I thought their level of participation was because I didn't pe penalize them early on when they were still figuring it out. And, and afterwards, they all sort of knew what they were supposed to do, show up with something to talk about, be part of the discussion, have read the books. Um, in terms of grading other things, I had a course on pedagogy, sort of a, a faculty reading group that was about um, rubrics. And most of it, the, the advice about rubrics, I didn't really care for, and I thought it was a little too anal and picky. Um, but the part that I really liked was the idea that you can use a rubric to tell the students what you're looking for and also to make it easier to grade what they're looking for. So if you have a rubric, give it to them. Give it to them before the assignment. You can put abstract things in the, in the rubric. You can put things like how deep was the thinking, how well did it engage the material. And then you just sort of read it and circle the things and if they disagree with it, it's not going to be more than a little bit up or down somewhere and maybe they can convince you or maybe they can rewrite it a little better to convince you that way. Um, and I even put in for all of my assignments 10% for sparkliness. <laughs> um, so, so I tell them that if they just fulfill the assignment, that's a B. If they want to get an A, they need to do something that makes me makes the paper kind of better than just fulfilling the assignment. And I give a list of, you know, it could be unusually deep. They could bring in other outside things. They could, um, you know, maybe write longer, but meaningfully longer, not just I filled up space longer. Um, and I find that students are just kind of okay with that. I mean, if they understand that just fulfilling the assignment is a B, then if they just fulfill the assignment and get a B, they just sort of say okay. If they expect fulfilling the assignment to be an A, then they feel cheated. Um, any, other, any other, I guess, ideas or concerns with um, assessment? Yeah. I had a comment about rubric. Um, I teach chemistry. And Hold on. Let's. Uh, actually, no, there's no way we can pull that off. Just go for it. <laughs> so I teach chemistry, but I do a written assignment in my instrumental analysis class. So it's mostly junior and senior majors. Um, and so they write a proposal. They have to propose a research topic and how they would 
go about solving that? And I had some issues with how do I assess that sort of assignment. Um, and sort of the traditional way we break lab reports is you get X points for your introduction, X points for your subject. Uh, and someone in the writing program directed me toward a rubric that had been developed in combination between um, writer, you know, writing instructors and chemists. And what was nice about it was it broke it down um, in a way where it again this to hit the top it was the you know the highest mark was it had to be sophisticated. They had gone through and designed a lot of the language in the rubric that I didn't have to then go through and figure that out. So they understood, like you said, you know, you were hitting sort of the five mark uh, out of six was if you hit everything, and they had already sort of chosen the wording. And what I also appreciated about it was they had designed it in such a way that it looked at the entire assignment, uh, and it in some ways combined the um, the science aspect with the writing aspect because. In the end, it's difficult to separate that, but it also had some numeric markers. You know, I like to, you know, am I seeing three to five errors in this area in terms of grammatical? Um, and so that also gave me, with my numeric sense, something I could uh, sort of track that that three to five went that it was happening, or maybe there were seven, you know, five to eight errors, and so that was distracting. So it gave both the written verbal as well as the numerical value that I could work through it. So, so that was something in terms of assessment, and I could see using that in any sort of co-learning and group learning because it was a more general uh, type of assessment. So, um, Do we have any comments about teacher evaluations? What's been your experience if you have you know, fallen flat with your students when it comes to that time? Go up here and up here. Do you want to start with the panel? OK. Um, I think I've had pretty good evaluations, um, even though um, they leave my class knowing that they don't know. Um, <laughs> the, actually, no, last year I had probably my worst um, evaluations ever. Um, in my moral philosophy class, which you'd think, moral philosophy, how could you not get the best evaluations <laughs> teaching them the good life? And, but what happened is uh, half of the students had a computer in the room. Used a, a laptop. A laptop. Yeah. And what I found is I just could not engage them. Uh, I, I think I'm pretty funny and charming and all these things, but Facebook somehow is better. Um, it's, it's a real problem, but we don't have to talk about that now. Um, the one thing I wanted to say about, so I think students will evaluate what you give them. If you instill in them the passion that you have for the subject, uh, if you teach them how to ask questions, I, I keep on saying that, but it's like, they get it. They really get it. Um, can I just say one word on the assessment? Um, I, I did something very interesting. I mean, a lot of people do peer review. Have you done that in your classes? I did a surprise peer review a couple of years ago, where because I wanted the paper actually to be finished, and then have them rewrite it. So I walked into the classroom, I collected all the papers, I said, surprise, we're going to do peer review now. Uh, and I had a uh, list of questions, you know, what's the main argument, is there textual evidence? Four students came to me and said, no, you cannot do that. I, I don't want my fellow students to see what I wrote. It's sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay because I'm getting paid to grade the thing, so if you want to hand in something bad, that's fine. But I don't want the person in the class to see how poorly I've written this paper. So I thought that's a very interesting, and, and it has a lot to do with their honor and integrity, and they want to appear to be good students. So I think peer review is a, is a very helpful component to build into your assignments. And, and it, it helps the students, um, both the readers, because they will read somebody else's paper and make comments on it, and somebody else is making comments on their paper, and like all that, they're going to rewrite it. And then hand in both to me so I can see whether they seriously looked at their comments, whether they did anything to address what was being raised as issues. And I, I just thought it was such a learning experience. Don't show it to them. No. <laughs> well, speaking of which, do no. any of the panelists or anybody out there offer like half semester or quarter semester class evaluations? Yeah. Could you share your experience with that? Uh, so the question was, do people have experience doing mid-semester evaluations of some sort? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I do it. More people work in small groups. They split like into teams of three or four, and we do like a flip chart. So it's like the plus two columns, and then the what would you change? 
So it's what's strong about the class at this point? What would you change? Yeah, I want to get that feedback midway through. I think that's really important. What's the point of like learning after 16 weeks and then I can't do anything about it? So I always do that. And then, I, and then the following week, I summarize it and give it back to them. Because you know, people don't always agree. Like for what's a strength for one person might be the downside for someone else. So then I have to decide what I think is best. <laughs> You know, I find this a mandatory thing, and I do it now earlier and earlier, sometimes four to five weeks, so I can make corrections quicker. And I actually like the conflicts from students mm -hmm. because I let them know that they conflict and how tough my job is as a professor. <laughs> and it builds some room for them to realize we can't do it all because they're asking for many different things. And sometimes we do it very simple, low-tech index card, one side, name one thing you like that you don't want to change, backside, one thing you don't like, do want to change. And this is part of the key, is that you focus on things you can change in the semester. Because otherwise you get stuff like, don't like the room. Well, that's <laughs> kind of tough to change, right? So I try and focus it. And sometimes I do more, you know, several questions on a survey. But either way works. The earlier, the better. And then I let them know, here's what you said. And here how it's tough it's going to be to do all what you want, because you're also different. Yeah, I want to uh, add to that that I've been doing this, I learned this here in one of these early uh, sessions here 15, 20 years ago, and I've been doing it for many, many years. It is one of the most valuable teaching techniques I use. Um, it's, it's very informal. Emphasize to your students that it's anonymous, and you will get better feedback. Um. Uh, can I go back to the question well, can I, um, can I reply to this question super quickly? Okay. I was just saying that, that I have not tried mid-semester evaluations, but what I have experimented with and have good success with is taking edited comments from last year's evaluations and handing them out with the syllabus at the start of class. Um, and so one of the things that I would do on the first day is, is look through some of this feedback and say, look, these are some of the criticisms that I think are legitimate and I've changed class a little bit because of it. Here are some of the criticisms that I don't think are legitimate, and this is why. And I include both good and bad things so that you can do that compare and contrast where they can see that some things that some students didn't like are other things that students, different students thought were the best thing about the class. Um, so that's a similar sort of idea, but I've tried to do it at the beginning. Yeah, I would just add, I do the midterm evaluation too. The other thing I do is that... Um, each class, and I, I don't do this right away, but after about three weeks, I say to them that um, I, I introduce something and I say that um, if during a class you're bored, uh, raise your hand and, uh, and say that you're bored. And it's really cool because it puts like a little electricity in the class and there's a sense in which the evaluation's happening sort of live. And when someone's bored, it, and, and it, sadly, students are a little shy to do it, but then you can encourage one or two to do it. And it's really interesting. Then the question is, well, why? What, what, have we gone beyond where your understanding is? Do we have to back up? Or are we just going so slow that we're just not there? And so um, it's, I would encourage to try it if you want. It's re I find it really neat. Um, just sort of like, mm -hmm. well, you know, if you're, if you're, not if you're lost. You don't need, sometimes, and, I, and I also say to them, you don't even have to explain it. It's not your job. All you have to do is say, I'm bored. And then it's like, whoa, OK, what am, you know, what am I doing wrong? Do I need a new room? Uh, whatever. <laughs> um, back there? Yeah. Uh, no, if anyone wants to finish that, I wanted to go back to the question yeah. piece. But Sure. Yeah. I was going to discuss more about the, uh, the early learner and the experiences that you've had with resistance. Or re was that so back to the SAT question? It's really good. I think <laughs> um, one piece that a lot, a lot of times we fail to uh, remember is that a lot of students don't even know how to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So what I have learned over the years is I've been teaching with using the same book, and I used to stand up and ask questions and have a discussion. And of course, you know, you don't get a lot of feedback sometimes, so I was working and working on how to improve this over the, over the years. And what I came up with was that the students had to ask questions before the class. They post them on Blackboard. The other students then have to respond to their classmates and bring that in as a, form, as a way to discuss their thoughts. So, um, the students get graded on two um, pieces of the assignment. One is they have to make ten questions related to the reading, and then the other piece is they have to respond to a classmate. So when I originally did this, I just assumed they would know how to ask questions. I realized that a lot of students didn't know how to ask questions, so I ended up 
um, providing a reading for them of how to ask high-level questions. Because you think they would know or have the knowledge, but I see a lot with my freshman students, they haven't had that opportunity to ask questions in high school. Mm -hmm. So once I guided them how to ask questions, and they're graded on their level of questions, mm -hmm. and that, that has been so successful, and the students absolutely love it. Because A, they don't have to write a paper, but they get to think, and I can see then what they're thinking about, but now they know how to structure the question. Would you be willing to share that resource if anybody else wants to find that paper? Yes, sure. Perhaps, Sounds like that kind of serves a similar purpose to what you were suggesting, Eric, mm -hmm. where they come in with mm -hmm. some questions or things that excite them on the blackboard, but too, I, I've also depending on how you want to use the technology. <coughs> and so I've also done the same sort of thing, because the questions they ask at the start <coughs> of the semester are horrible, and so we have to go through learning what's a good question or how to phrase a good question or even even just put up enough information on the board to know what the question really is. Um, but if, if we're backtracking through the questions about one of the important questions I think was about the, the teaching evaluations. Um, I would say that in my experience, the more honest I am with them about what's going on, the more the average goes up because otherwise they're just confused and befuddled and think you're just being a jerk for no reason instead of lecturing like the nice people do. Um, the other thing is that the, the, in the classes where I do more of the I'm not the expert interventions, one of the things that happens is that the distribution of evaluations becomes completely bimodal. So the students who sort of get what's going on, and most of them don't like it at the beginning, but, but by the end, luckily, almost all of the students give me highest ranked evaluations. And there's a chunk of class who either never got it or never liked it, and they give me really low evaluations with absolutely nothing in the middle. Like no fours, fives, completely nothing. Um, and luckily, at least for me in my experience, it's always been the vast majority that gave me the high scores. Um, but I guess, I mean, you have to feel it out and figure it out. Is there anything more that uh, the panelists can discuss about reaching with those people that aren't interested or get bored quickly or mm -hmm. really just dislike this format? I had a question actually about the questions, um, mm -hmm. which is that you guys both talked about that they're bad questions or that the questions don't get good. And I'm just wondering, uh, what is a bad question? I mean, what? Yes, no. Um, Yeah. Something that facilitates discussion because that serves the purpose of the discussion for the class. Because I was coming with my own questions to lead discussion, but I everyone's reading the book differently and they have their own interpretation of the information. So I wanted to know what their questions are. And I say there's no there isn't really a right and wrong, but there's a level. Your grade is based on the level of questioning. So you can't Whatever your thoughts or your questions are, that is not good or bad. It's how you ask the question and how to lead a discussion. So I'm sorry. So, so for me, it's about the sophistication. So what was up with the mushrooms <laughs> would be a bad question. <laughs> um, Holt seems to think that the guy in the woods with the mushrooms is a good example of all moral questions even if it becomes yes or no, like, is he right, or I thought that was strange, page 158 would be great, right? I mean, something that gives some context that says, why were you thinking about it, that gives us a place to go to look if you weren't really ready for that question. Um, so, so it's not, I mean, so in the beginning, I think they probably have good questions, but they have no idea how to articulate it in a way that can create some discussion. Is that... Are there any other ways that people um, encourage better questions or more detailed questions besides giving a, a resource and modeling cues that you can offer? Can I just switch gears a little bit? Sure. Is there, sure. Is there anybody on that topic? Or we're good. Great. Go ahead. So um, I teach uh, documentary filmmaking, um, directing <coughs> college students and film students. And uh, we go out in the community and to capture people's stories in short documentary style films. And a big part of uh, talking to people in the community and trying to capture their story 
is to understand one's own story. Mm -hmm. And I have exercises that I do to help people sort of get there. But I'm <coughs> not, well, you probably know the answer to this, that there is a lot of resistance to go, going to an emotional place. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying a place that you're being forced to go. I'm just talking about being a little revealing. Um, and uh, they, they really are so unaccustomed to self-examination and emotional uh, language, uh, vocabulary, um, and feeling that a classroom, you know, I, I have things to learn and data to back up my answers. And I say I'm all for good research and backing up and footnoting. But if we do that kind of learning, at the exclusion of, of emotional issues and life and um, uh, the heart, and I, I actually talk about the heart now, um, that's because I'm over 60, um, and I'm, I feel courageous enough to do that. I never used to, but um, the, uh, I, I think that giving um, weight to the importance of emotional issues mm -hmm. and emotional life, um, in, in certainly in my area of work, but in general, is an important uh, thing to discuss. And I know it's a little bit off point, but in the other way, it is about being co-learners and mm -hmm. um, opening one's own heart in order to reach your students and the community. So that was a, a great question. So the context of it is, an anthropology film documentary class where you're trying to get students to make their own stories and one of the things you learned out of this is that the students themselves are very resistant to opening up and becoming vulnerable and particularly in that context but I, I actually think it, it is very on topic and applies to lots of contexts that the question is how do you get students to be able to be vulnerable and emotional and open in class which I think many of us might think could be even a prerequisite for doing this type of learning. Uh, <clears throat> well, P Pascal says the heart has its reasons, which reason cannot comprehend. <laughs> um, uh, my Western philosophy class uh, has a theme, and the theme is self-knowledge. And um, we spend a good deal of time with Plato, and we talk about Eros and Thanatos, love and death. Um, Socrates says philosophy is the practice of dying. Uh, so they have to confront, they don't always necessarily open up right away. They want to look at it as an abstract issue, but then when we keep on talking about this again and again and again, all of a sudden, whoops, just like that, all of a sudden um, some of them will say, whoa, this is, this is about us too, life. Mortality, what does it mean to be a more human being? How am I supposed to make sense of that? What if everything's meaningless? That's, that's usually when we get to the existentialists. But, um, uh, so no, I, I, I completely hear you. And, um, and it's hard. It's so much harder, right, than the other part. So. Yeah, I, I think your comment gets to the heart of a, this whole session, really, which is that, um, you know, we have this notion that uh, I, I think graduation is so indicative of what a lot of education is. We have, when students graduate, they have this robe that covers their body, and they have this hat that covers from here. So it's like education is this thing that happens in the frontal lobe that sort of, you know, that's what we're trying to do. And yet we know that that's not how we learn. And, um, and I actually don't think the challenge is that students don't feel comfortable going there. I actually think professors don't feel comfortable going there. And I think that um, in some ways, uh, you know, we want students to show vulnerability, but what are we doing? And so I think that in some ways this co-learning is a way of, of saying, I'm a human being too. I got you. I mean, I, I think it's just kind of amazing what we do. We go into these classrooms and we got, you know, students coming, have, you know, with different challenges in their life and we kind of get together in a room and we assume everyone's on board, everyone's kind of done the reading, everyone, you know, we say yes, people get different things out of the reading, but basically the assumption is that if they don't get what I get, they haven't done the reading somehow. And I just think this is a fabulous question. I think the challenge for us is how to, how to be in the class meaningfully, vulnerably, and so forth, and productively. 
And so how do we sort of take that, and it's not simply, this isn't simply a place that we express our emotions, but how do we tap into, express them, and then use them in the service of learning in some level? And I think that's kind of a mystery, but I think to keep the mystery alive in the classroom is absolutely right on. And I, I would say that um, one of the problems with getting people to teach in these sorts of ways or to, to value the sort of general education things is that in the context of any one course, it could be trivial for the student whether or not they're engaged in this manner that you're discussing. But I think over the course of their education, it's crucial. So if they're in my psych stats class, psychological statistics class, and they don't want to be emotional and open up, that's fine. But but ultimately the question is, well, why are you majoring in psychology, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, so if they don't know why they're doing what they're doing and why they're in college and why, I mean, people change. I mean, I, especially at this age, I mean, what, what you're trying to do changes, but, but you have to be vested in it in some way. And if you know why you're majoring in chemistry, then maybe a lot of these requirements would make sense, and that, that automatically creates engagement across across the whole arc of the time, even if it doesn't matter so much in any one class. I was wondering if we could speak more about that um, with the hard sciences. Is this possible in hard sciences, or things with supposed definite answers? Everybody's had experience with managing emotional intelligence at the same time? Sciences do not have definite answers, do they? Um, <laughs> <there are more. laughs> if, if I were trying to do this in a hard science, and I've done it a little bit in stats classes, and I think parts of psychology get very hard science-y, um, I think that it's harder to do it in lower level classes where there is more just sort of a, a flood of background knowledge that the students need. But you can do it a little bit. And I think even in the, the hardest sciences, my God, isn't your goal to get them to be able to do this by the time they're seniors? I mean, to be able to engage a question in chemistry they don't know the answer to and maybe nobody does. I mean, that's what you're trying to build them towards, isn't it? Uh, we restructured our advanced labs actually to do that specifically. Uh, so they spend the first, there's a professor who's in charge of the lab course in the fall and then a professor who's in charge of it in the spring and there's about four of us who rotate through it and so in the fall we have sort of learning goals, certain tasks that we want them to be able, or skills we want them to learn. How to use a specific instrument, how to make a, you know, a calibration curve, which is a measurement uh, skill to have and then what we do, but it's all in an overarching research project that literally is a research project, the same as someone does as their PhD or master's, where it's, um, we don't know where it's gonna go, so we're having them do uh, experiments that haven't been done before. Uh, so they don't work sometimes, sometimes they do work. So part of what we're trying to have them do is this learning how to make a mistake or have something just not work and what do they do next. And so then what we do in the spring is they spend the first two weeks of the semester writing up uh, a proposal, it's a shorter proposal, um, of what they're gonna do. They have to tell us what they're going to do for the rest of the semester. So we sort of switch from the professor being in charge to the students being in charge. And so the professor then becomes more of a facilitator, making sure they can sort of do what it is they want to do, you know, make sure it is a reasonable goal to complete in that semester. And so that's how we've tried to implement it in a hard science, this sort of, you know, we can't do that as well with our um, general chemistry and organic. You know, as a department, we are looking at ways to do some of that type of stuff but uh, where we've tried to do it is in our laboratory, which is in the end goal, like research oriented. You know, that is the goal of it, rather than uh, some of this grew out of what we used to do is you would do one experiment one week to learn a specific skill, then you'd do something else the following week. And if something didn't work, they would just hand in the report and be done with it. So part of this is this, it didn't work, or you made a mistake, how are you gonna solve that problem for next time? So. Yes? Um, I taught a class in qualitative research methods of peace research. I'm not a peace research specialist. I'm a monitoring evaluation qualitative quantitative research methods uh, specialist. But I was thinking about it's the how-to and how do you get them to learn how to do the how-to, uh, whether it's yeah, like documentary filming, uh, 
in-depth individual interviews or focus groups or observations or ethnographic techniques. There's still a how-to. So in that sense, I want to get them to do that. But what I wanted to measure or wanted to get them to and to bring in that emotional, that their own involvement with it, every assignment, and, and I was using somebody else's syllabus, but you know I pushed it a little further. Every assignment that I had them do to learn those how-to skills, it wasn't really about what they learned from that interview. I mean, there was a question about that, but they had to write up a paper reflecting on this, and in every one of those was the questions, what did you learn? What was challenging? What went well? What didn't? What would you have done differently? How, how did you feel about it? To bring that engagement in. So it was about them reflecting on the process. And each time, and I forewarned them, there would be peer reviews of each one of these throughout the class. So they had to expose their own personal involvement to the class, and they had to sit silently in the group discussions where everyone else discussed it. They could respond, but they had to hear those responses. And for those who felt uncomfortable talking about their own personal involvement, it was much easier in the small groups, especially knowing that everyone had to reveal that somehow in these small groups. So then that was this measure of having learned the how-to through looking at how they've reflected and learned about that. So in the end, they know how to start to develop how to do these specific skills, even if they didn't initially end up in the results that they might have used for the grade. Well, we're actually about five minutes until the session ends. And one question I'd really like to ask our panelists, if you'd like to, to discuss this or any other final remarks you'd like to share, is what advice you'd give to a faculty member that's interested in becoming more of a, a guide on the side, if you will. Would you like to start with Eric? Sure. Um, I mean, getting back to my recurring theme of brutal honesty, um, I would say that if you're going to experiment with this, don't be afraid to tell the class that you're experimenting with it. Don't be afraid to tell them, you know, this is something that I'm doing for the first time. I used to do it this way. We're going to try to do it that way. I think it's going to work for these reasons. But you guys are going to help me. And I'm going to ask you, you know, what should I change if I do this again? What's working? What isn't? And this is part of the learning process is being taught things in ways that nobody's been taught these things before. Um, so. And I think that that can make them more comfortable when things go wrong. It can make things a little jo more joking and livelier. But it also stops you from having to pretend that this is something you've done 50 times before and that when something goes wrong, it's their fault because it worked the last 45 classes you did this in and why hasn't it worked with them? Um, and I think that that can really help the atmosphere and help you feel more comfortable taking risks. I think it's pretty good advice. Um, I have, do I have anything to add? Yes, I think you should start every class with a Socratic dialogue. And, and that way they're used to this idea of asking questions and, and that learning is a dialogical engagement. That's how learning takes place. Um, and as you know, everything that comes after Plato is but a footnote to Plato. So it will always be relevant. Um, <laughs> I hope you can do better than that. <laughs> no, that was good. Um, just a couple of quick thoughts. One, one is, you use this question, you use the word mistake. And I was wondering, you know, how, what ways can we, what ways can students make mistakes? I mean, it, it just seems like that's how we learn if we make mistakes. But sometimes the classroom's set up where, you know, mistakes are, and I don't have an answer to that. I just thought that was an interesting word you used. Um, so two, two thoughts in terms of advice, I guess, is, is sort of to, to every time that I want to deal with a how-to, I'd love it to be driven by a why. And so, and, and to keep that alive, because then I know why I'm doing it. And that may change. The why certainly would change over time, but it just seemed to me just to raise that question. But the other thing I would say to a colleague who's thinking about this is I would say do it because it's easier. It, it saves time. I mean, in terms of class prep, I, f I feel like over time, the less I prepare, the better my class goes. And in fact, this method actually allows one to prepare less because what one has to just do is, f for me anyway, it's figure out what are those questions that are driving this session. It's not even about 
I mean, a lot of our conversation is getting the questions from the students, but for me, it's like just figuring out why do I care about this? What's exciting about it? And then going into the classroom, it's, it's, it just seems like things happen. It's when I over-prepare and I got all this material and I've lost, tr lost sight of why I'm doing this, then it's really, it's not a lot of fun. So I would say do it because it's easier and it's fun. Um, you know, forget about all these lofty other reasons. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you all so much for joining me, and we'll be available at the gate for a few minutes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, uh, and we're getting a wave in the back room for people to please remember to fill out the comment cards.